today. Why? Because we're going to discuss caucuses. Why we need to discuss caucuses? Why should we should care? It's somewhere across the ocean, somewhere behind the mountains. The answer is very simple. It is important. Why it is important? Hopefully, we'll find out today during the discussion. Next slide, please. The topic of today's discussion is cultural perspectives, geopolitics, and energy security of the Caucasus. Our distinguished panel will introduce themselves shortly. After our initial remarks, we'll be happy to jointly, four of us, answer your questions, reply to your comments. And we have outstations across TRADOG to have a chance to participate through VTC. As before, the session is being recorded and the video will be posted on our, on our website for further educational purposes. There would be a specific period for questions and answers. In order to ask your question or make a comment, please use microphones in front of you or acro around the room. One is here, one in the middle, another one there. At this time, just to set the stage, I would like to provide a brief overview of the Caucasus to find out where it's located, why, why it is important to some extent at this point before even beginning the discussion. Greater, uh, next slide please. Greater Caucasus range, which includes Mount Elbrus. It's about 19,000 uh, feet, divides North and South Caucasus. You can see South Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, and North Caucasus, which includes Dagestan, Chechnya, with the capital Grozny, and other smaller republics, which are the subjects of the present day Russian Federation. Caucasus as a whole, culturally and linguistically very diverse, over about 20 million, more than 50 ethnic groups, you can imagine. Some languages, Turkic linguistic family, represented by Azerbaijani or Azeri, in the European, which includes Armenian and Ossetian, by the way, it also includes Russian and English, as you know, Chechen and Dagestani, to the best of my knowledge, not spoken anywhere in the world, unless there is a diaspora, of course, which belongs to the so-called Nakh linguistic family or the so-called Nakh Dagestani linguistic family. So it's spoken mostly in Chechnya, in Gushetia, and Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. There is an independent country, Republic of Georgia, used to be part of the Soviet Union. Religiously, culturally, this area is very diverse as well. Azerbaijan is uh, nominally Muslim, although very secular. Armenia and Georgia, I'm talking about the South Caucasus, mostly Christian for the last 1,500 years. Caucasus invaded by Arabs, Mongols, Persians, Turks, and others. For the past at least 200 years, Russia has been the major player in the region. After the demise of the USSR, what happened? There are still several major conflicts simmering, unresolved. Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict around Nagorno-Karabakh led to more than 30,000 dead. Chechnya conflict between the Chechen militants and Russian forces led to more than 70,000 uh, dead. Authors like Leo Tolstoy, everybody knows Leo Tolstoy because of his famous work, and Alexander Dumas widely described the region because of its beauty and mostly because of the war 
wars which have been going on since 1817 until 1864, mostly when the so-called Imam Shamid was captured by, by, by a Russian general. Other quick facts, just to set the stage for this fascinating discussion. The Caspian Sea is becoming a big deal. What is it? 700 miles long. It contains around 200 billion barrels of oil and up to 300 trillion uh, of natural uh, gas of cubic feet in Europe and the former Soviet Union, cubic meters. Much of the area remains unexplored. Five countries, literal countries, border the Caspian Sea. Guess what? Actually, the Caspian Sea is not a sea. It's a lake by geographical definitions. You know why? Because there is no outlet to the ocean. Did you know that? That's amazing. But the size is huge. Disputes over control of the resources and boundaries still exist. Why? Because the legal status of the Caspian Sea unresolved since the demise of the Soviet Union. When those literal countries, of course, except Iran, uh, were part of the Soviet Union, it was not a big deal. But when they became independent, there, there's a lot of confusion still simmering. This is a quick background. We can talk about this very important strategic economical region for years, not even days or months or years. So for years. But I would like to stop here. Thank you. <coughs> uh, my name is Bob Bauman. I'm a director of the MMAS program uh, at the college and a professor of history with a focus on uh, Russia, the former Soviet Union, and uh, the areas around the uh, periphery. Uh, to include both Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, uh, and, uh, and Central Asia. Uh, to begin, I would just offer a few uh, broad brush observations that kind of connect uh, the, uh, the past uh, to the present. Uh, I suppose this, an historian has to do that uh, to legitimize his presence uh, uh, here. Uh, but I also think there are a few useful things to, to keep, in track, uh, keep track of um, that uh, help us sort out the general picture uh, in the Caucasus. You can argue, I think, that there are four, perhaps five, major storylines uh, that emerge here historically. Now, the first two uh, arguably involve Armenia and, uh, and Georgia. Both are uh, ancient Christian kingdoms with a long history um, and a long established identity as an independent culture, civilization, or state. They've got a long track record um, and uh, a deep cultural history, and they're, they're very much aware of it. Uh, Azerbaijan is, is a little bit different. There is, of course, a lot of history there, uh, but uh, far less as an independent kingdom or a state. Uh, the historical experience of Azerbaijan has generally been in the embrace of uh, the Persians or the Turks uh, or the Russians uh, more recently. Uh, indeed, uh, the Soviet Union has had a, a great deal to do with the formation of a modern uh, state of Azerbaijan, uh, crafting a lot of that experience. Uh, that um, you might say shapes the current consciousness of, uh, of the country. The other two storylines uh, involve the uh, populations uh, to whom Dr. Ibrahimov uh, referred, such as the, the Chechens, the Ingushians, and so forth, uh, who live on the, the northern fringe, uh, and to some degree even in the interior, of the Caucasus mountain range. Uh, you have the Transcaucasus region in the south, Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh, and Armenia. And you've got the, the North Caucasus, uh, but right along the fringes in the mountains, uh, you have the uh, uh, Chechens and Gushis, you have Dagestanis, and a, and a host of other tribes, uh, heavily but not entirely uh, Muslim. Uh, they had to be subjugated uh, by the Russian Empire, um, mostly in the 19th century, uh, in a protracted struggle that lasted, uh, depending on when you start uh, your measurement, uh, around uh, around six decades. Uh, and as you know from uh, the course of events in the last 20 years, that's still kind of a work in progress as far as Russia's uh, concerned. Uh, and there's a great deal of turbulence and turmoil 
in, uh, in the North Caucasus. The, the fifth storyline is that of the Russians themselves, uh, who populate significant areas of the North uh, Caucasus around Stavropol, uh, the area from which uh, Gorbachev uh, came, uh, and, uh, and other areas. The uh, Russians, as a country that expanded to empire along their own frontiers, uh, have an expansion history that is not that uh, dissimilar from that of the United States. Uh, spreading out uh, from a territorial base, you know, not launching ships overseas to colonize, uh, but progressively swallowing up ground along its own, uh, along its own frontiers. In the, uh, around the year 1800, uh, the Russian southern frontier, and this would be at the, the turn of reigns from Catherine the Great to uh, Paul I, uh, at that time Russia's southern frontier was marked by the so-called uh, uh, Caucasian Line, which was a series of forts along the frontier, not unlike those of which Fort Leavenworth was a part in the 19th century. Uh, Fort Leavenworth, founded in, uh, in 1827, was part of a string of forts along what was then the American West. Uh, Russia had a very similar MO in, in many respects, with one notable difference, and that is the, uh, the Cossacks. Uh, the Cossacks were more of a, uh, a social estate um, than, a, uh, than an ethnic group. Uh, they were much of their role for the Russian Empire was as military colonizers. And they had entire settlements. When the Russians wanted to expand, they would detach clumps of Cossack communities to establish a frontier deeper into whatever region they were going. Uh, so the Cossack presence uh, was instrumental to moving Russia south of the, uh, of the Caucasus line. Uh, the event that precipitated Russia's uh, six decade or so war in the 19th century uh, was the formal annexation of Georgia in, in 1801 which meant, if you look at the map, uh, that Russia suddenly now owned uh, territory that was to the south of the North Caucasus, uh, where Russian sovereignty was not recognized, uh, south of the North Caucasus, where Russian sovereignty was not recognized. Uh, so the, uh, oh, where is that? Sorry, I'm uh, technophobe, and a little slow here. OK, thanks, Mike. The, uh, uh, so, with the annexation of, uh, of Georgia, uh, Russia still had this intervening territory uh, that was kind of a no man's land, uh, over which they asserted publicly uh, their dominion, but had yet to make it practical. Um, the annexation of Georgia, uh, by the way, resulted in the kind of the reconsolidation of the, Ru of the old Georgian kingdoms into a single entity. Uh, and the Soviet Union, as with Azerbaijan, uh, played a significant role in crafting the, uh, the modern state of Georgia. Uh, Dr. Ibrahimov referred to the resistance in uh, the North Caucasus uh, led for several decades by a, an important historical figure called uh, Shamil. Uh, again, if you are grasping for a Western reference point, uh, some might have referred to him as, uh, say, the, the Geronimo of the Caucasus, uh, something along those lines. Uh, who organized the resistance and, and made some efforts to set up a true kingdom and a dynasty. Now, this was never fulfilled because he was finally defeated, um, although it was uh, a defeat that had an unusual ending. Uh, following his surrender, uh, he was exiled out of the North Caucasus region uh, and uh, placed in, uh, in St. Petersburg, where St. Petersburg, Russia, where he became something of a celebrity, uh, as, incidentally, Geronimo did. <laughs> Uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and in fact, uh, Shamil and the, the general who, who defeated him uh, occasionally made public appearances together. They exchanged correspondence. Uh, there was a rather interesting relationship uh, that, uh, uh, that ensued. Now you fast forward to the, to the Soviet period, and then you have the, this time of state consolidation that I mentioned in uh, uh, Armenia, but especially Georgia, and, uh, and Azerbaijan. A uh, number of scholars have argued that really uh, the current states of Georgia um, and Azerbaijan owe a lot to the Soviet Union uh, for their current identity and configuration as, as states. And this is because the Soviet Union deliberately cultivated the institutions around which states could form. In addition to governing institutions, um, uh, they made sure there were universities uh, and, and whatnot to emphasize development of the uh, of the local culture. Uh, that's not to say that the Soviet Union ever had any plan to 
turn them loose as actual independent states. That was, that was beyond the plan. Uh, but the Soviets did, at least inadvertently, lay some of the foundation for future statehood. Uh, during the, uh, the Second World War, uh, the great patriotic war in S Soviet history, um, nationalities of the North Caucasus, uh, in particular a number of them, and these would include Chechens uh, and uh, Ingushis and Meskheti Turks, uh, found themselves branded by Stalin as traitor nationalities. Uh, and that is not so much because of what they did as, as because of what the Nazis did during the invasion. Uh, the Nazis actively recruited among some of the North Caucasus Turkic populations on the assumption that they could be rallied to the anti-Russian or anti-Soviet cause a little more easily than some other populations. Um, they did, in fact, successfully recruit enough folks to create a, a division or two of, uh, of forces. Um, for Stalin, uh, the guilt of some was enough to uh, imply the guilt of all. And so they were branded, as I said, traitor nationalities at the end of the war and uh, forcibly exiled en masse uh, to Uzbekistan and, uh, and Western Siberia. Uh, they began making their way uh, back uh, during the Khrushchev period when he relaxed uh, the exile uh, a little bit, but many were still in exile until late in the, uh, the period of the Soviet Union. Uh, that, by the way, underscores a lot of the ongoing hostility in the North Caucasus between the Russians and the Chechens and, and so forth. Uh, you've got this you know, history of subjugation in the 19th century, the forcible exile in the 20th century, um, when in the 1990s, uh, Chechnya uh, tried to assert its independence uh, from, uh, from Russia, this was uh, quickly met with a, uh, a military response and led to the, the decade of warfare uh, that you're probably uh, somewhat familiar with. Uh, even now, Russia has a rather uneasy relationship with a client state in, uh, in Chechnya. The current president of, uh, of Chechnya, Kadyrov, uh, has an interesting platform that reflects his predicament. Uh, to the Russians, uh, he says, deal with me because I will keep Chechnya in the camp and, and relatively stable. To his domestic audience in Chechnya, he says, deal with me because I will keep Russian troops out of Chechnya. It's a, it's a tricky bargain, uh, but he's managed to navigate uh, that line. Now, that's, that's not without uh, considerable dispute. Uh, the uh, so-called... Uh, uh, Emirate of the Caucasus, uh, and uh, more recently, uh, the Islamic State uh, have both uh, cultivated roots in uh, Chechnya and Dagestan and uh, continue to pose a serious challenge uh, to uh, uh, Kadyrov's state. There's already been mention of the uh, on again, off again, but lately almost on again uh, conflict in Nagorno Karabakh uh, between Armenia. And, and Azerbaijan. The politics here are fairly simple in terms of the, the age-old diplomatic axiom, the uh, enemy, of the, my enemy is my friend. Uh, because uh, Armenia uh, has forged a relationship uh, with Russia, uh, Azerbaijan has looked extensively elsewhere uh, for friends and has uh, tried to cultivate uh, good relations uh, with the West, um, as has uh, Georgia, and indeed uh, even, even this summer. Uh, and Georgia has tried to strengthen relations uh, with NATO, and there have been public uh, statements very recently uh, to the effect uh, from Georgians, you know, when will NATO begin to act on promises that were made uh, now almost a decade ago about uh, bringing Georgia uh, into the fold? Of course, you had the uh, Russian invasion, uh, so-called, in, uh, in 2008, uh, which was based in, in South Ossetia, uh, which revealed um, what is starting to emerge almost as a, um, a game plan uh, from the Russian point of view. That is, you find an enclave population across the border uh, whom you can energize um, and start to use them uh, as, uh, as, in effect, a, a bridgehead uh, for destabilization operations, not necessarily uh, conquest. But Russia has managed to sow instability in Georgia. Uh, clearly, uh, they've done it with an enclave Russian population uh, in Ukraine. Um, and this situation has other border states with significant enclaves of, of Russians in particular, uh, say Kazakhstan or the Baltic states, rather nervous uh, based on uh, the precedents uh, uh, heretofore. The uh, politics then of the Caucasus remain uh, pretty dynamic. Um, democracy has had trouble 
uh, getting a, uh, a strong toehold uh, in, uh, in the caucuses, though it's made, uh, made some progress. The pull between East and West, uh, the inevitable influence of Russia um, are all big considerations as we look at uh, the current state of affairs there. With that, I'll stop. I think I about sh yeah, shot up my minute. So with that. Great. Um, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Bauman. That was very interesting and informative. Um, Mr. Otto, please. Good afternoon. My name is Gus Otto. I'm the Defense Intelligence Chair here at the school and the DIA Defense Intelligence Agency rep here to the CAC. Uh, you might find similar uh, behaviors in the intel officers on the panel that will read our notes. A minor of, of my own, my own uh, development. I didn't go back to DIA and, and pull these from our analysts. They're intentionally provocative as the anchor man for this uh, panel discussion in hopes of spurring on a good positive discussion. Starting with Azerbaijan, uh, following a rough start during a wartime period with Armenia and national independence in 1991, uh, and two deposed leaders year after year in those first couple of years of their independence, the international community got to watch Haider Aliyev uh, take over um, Azerbaijan. Despite present reports of nepotism and corruption at the highest levels, to include Aliyev, uh, one of the things that he was able to do was develop a national strategy for Azerbaijan. As a result, uh, this has allowed them to avoid playing too nice with any single regional player. And it's allowed them to thwart some of the advances of uh, Russia in particular. The relations that Azerbaijan developed with both Iran and Turkey allow it additional geopolitical stability. And as Haider died, his son took over uh, the reins in 2003 and has governed generally in the same fashion, consistent generally with uh, that national strategy. The growth of Baku stands as a diamond in the rough of the Caucasus, and as an example of the success and wealth coming into the country, it is also somewhat of a distraction. Because while there are other developing towns throughout Azerbaijan, they don't en enjoy anywhere close to the benefits that Baku does. Further, the nation remains somewhat susceptible to the rumblings of its neighbors and lives in increasing fear of that what next philosophy that Russia definitely bears in the region. The success of the Baku, Tbilisi, Cyan pipeline and the South Caucasus pipelines allows for a growing number of stakeholders to support stability throughout the country. It and the natural gas and oil access have allowed Azerbaijan a steady, if somewhat unpredictable, income source. Since the, attack, uh, the attacks by Russia on the Ukraine, the European Union has looked to Azerbaijan as a more critical alternative to fuel than ever before and includes an invitation to support and co-develop the Trans-Caspian Pipeline that's many years into the distance. The military buildup under both Aliyev saw a larger than average spending in their country's national gross domestic product. The main thrust of that buildup is believed and, and discussed uh, rhetorically to recover the territory lost during the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. In the meantime, Large swaths of other Azerbaijan suffer from a lack of basic needs, and that money could be spent better than on just their military endeavors. There continues to be a weak employment uh, outside of Baku, and it's especially susceptible to uh, fluctuating oil prices. And we'll see this as a theme throughout each of the uh, Caucasus nations. Azerbaijan would be better positioned if, one, they spent more time and money to diversify their economy. They could take a note from the UAE, for example in that diversification without an over-reliance on petrol money. Two, seeking a prolonged and meaningful peace negotiation with Armenia. Not trying to take sides here, but this festering of issues on the Norgano karabakh issue is not going to get resolved unless somebody is willing to put some things aside and achieve some substantive peace agreements. Three, cleaning up their own house, the corruption and nepotism, in order to establish more uh, enticing, enticement for foreign domestic uh, investment, and finally, uh, better positioning themselves to re resist that Russian revanchism that we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, not only in my comments, but in those of, uh, I'm sure, will come up in our question and answer period. Moving on to Armenia. By contrast to Azerbaijan, 
It is probably the greatest concern for the international community, namely the West and certainly the United States, because of their willingness to stay close to Russia, threatening to destabilize Armenia in the long run and the Caucasus in the short run. It's a victim of its location and, as we've already mentioned, is landlocked. Uh, it, it, it increases its reliance then on its neighbors for commerce. Unfortunately, it, that 20-year legacy over Nagorno-Karabakh still locks them into greater depression. Since the war with Azerbaijan, there are only two trade routes open in their weak econ economy, namely Georgia and Iran. That economy is weak because it's based on antiquated industrial models that they inherited from the collapse of the Soviet Union with little, there is some, but with little foreign direct investment. Compounded by a rule of law that allows for influence peddling and corruption and a heavy feeling of Russian influence tapping both the licit and illicit economies, which are really bringing a lot of money away from the people of Armenia. Remittances, which John mentioned briefly, or sending money for, uh, back into their home country by, by Armenians who live abroad, make up at least a fifth, if not a quarter, of Armenian GDP. So they're relying on a quarter of their economy to be mailed home, think of a Western Union, by people who live outside of Armenia. That larger profitable petrol industries that are there are largely Russian-owned and shackle Armenia as a result. Further, their military, despite efforts to evolve beyond an old Soviet model, became in, entrenched due to Armenia's decision to join the Moscow-driven Eurasian Economic Union that we mentioned earlier as well. That decision all but abrogated any independence of this sovereign nation under Putin. Though not as staunch as the old Soviet Union, this move smacks of revanchist movements by Russia. Though it removes barriers to trade among Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, it fails to open markets to any nation with cash flow. The ruble's year-long plummet makes trade even more a problem, increasing interdependence on the EEU and breaking the already pauper country's savings. As a result, there's little hope for near-term improvement despite recent change in leadership at the Armenian national level. Now under Sargyasan, since April of this year, 2015, there seems no clear willingness to resist Putin or Russian efforts, no desire to modernize their rule of law, nor any hope they might resolve long-standing strife between Turkey and Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, there's every appearance Sargassian chooses to use the government as a personal tool to advance he and his cronies' reputation in the eyes of their Russian handholders. It looks a lot like a baby oligarchy a la Moscow. Modeling the Russian oligarchy is a poor place to set one's sights. Sadly, the great people of Armenia will continue to suffer in the meantime. Possible roles for Azerbaijan and Armenia to work together would be to channel into Iran. Though I mostly mention normalized relationships between Iran and Azerbaijan, Armenia has a diminished capacity on this front. One way they could move forward together would include possible petrol agreements, pipeline agreements. You saw there's an unfinished pipeline from Tabriz that could flow through the region with relative ease. And each of these offers an opportunity to grow new relationships and overcome generations of animosity. Georgia, it's getting better, right? So Georgia can relate probably better than anybody else to the Ukrainian invasion. It remembers all too well the 2008 attempted invasion of Abkhazia and South Ossetia and feels the constant longings of Russians' wanton desires. Though it doesn't suffer as much as Azerbaijan or Armenia from the economic woes, thanks to its economic diversification, its growing ties with Russia place it in a precarious position. Following the 2003 ousting of Shevardnadze, thanks to the Rose Revolution, they ha still haven't enjoyed the promises of a new era of rule, and law, law, rule of law and reform. Corruption remains a problem, though not as great. It enjoys a, more of a melting pot society based on kind of the ethnic and religious diversity that they, that they have there. They reflect a larger region of the Caucasus writ large, though tensions remain between the ethnic and some of the religious segments in the country. During the invasion by Russia of, in 08, 
south of Session of Abkhazia, the more Russian peoples there were cordoned off from Maine, Georgia. Following Russian declarations of independent statehood of these territories and continued rhetorical increases just this year and last, there remains high tension in Georgia of a, of a hostile takeover or hostile annexation akin to what we witnessed in Crimea. Where the West's sanctions against Russia due to the Ukraine invasions had an impact both on Russia and the West, Georgia has enjoyed some of the benefits, especially textiles and agriculturally. Georgia's ex economic diversification and fear of Russian meddling probably served their greatest strength in the short to medium terms, and in the long term resolving regional issues with other nation states, developing a more sustainable, legal, transparent, and accountable national government would go a long way towards stabilizing the region and the country. Because we wanted to be provocative and because they live as neighbors to Iran and Turkey, and we've talked about living in the shadow of Russia, let me talk a little bit about Iran. Iran could play a stronger role in the region. At present, it's an afterthought to the Caucasus. Depending on how the U.S. and West resolved standing distrust over nuclear issues, opening Iran would allow for increased trade and economic activity that might see all nation states in the region levitate them, elevate themselves from their current positions. There's both a cultural and religious component to all things Iran, and a careful engagement plan is required regardless of the direction the United States chooses to pursue and should rely heavily on the members of the caucus. Finally, Turkey. Arguably, Turkey is going through its own cultural crisis on multiple fronts due to the refugee flows from Syria and northern Iraq and the perpetual challenge of treating its varied Kurd population with dignity and respect. Turkey's willingness to take sides on the armenia azerbaijani conflict is not helping. Turkey's laying blame for a genocide and mass atrocities is even an ongoing debate in our own Congress here in the United States. Turkey's position impacts the region, period. Its stance stokes Armenian ire and soothes Azerbaijani's ego. Turkey, whose important role in the region and the world needs to change its tune on this front and foster new and lasting peace uh, settlement efforts, especially with regard to Nagorno-Karabakh, rather than take sides, it would be good to see Turkey seek to move forward across diplomatic, geographic, and economic bounds in an effort to raise all boats to better all of the segments of society. It's doing exactly this with the Kurds and came precariously close to doing that in 2008 and 2009 during what we came to call the football diplomacy. It just kind of stalled. In an effort to release the pressure Erdogan feels from some of Ataturk's legacy, cementing a successful and mutually beneficial end to these negotiations would definitely be a step in the right direction. As the anchorman for this panel, then, I'll close by pointing to the map of the ethno-linguistic realities on the ground. If we could go back just a couple of slides. I think one more. As you can see, none of the geopolitical borders coincide with the ethnic divisions in the Caucasus. That should scream to us as diplomats, information, military, and economic specialists that it's going to be really hard to, to sort out. Aside from the very real risks the caucuses continue to face in terms of identity, nationality, and sustainability, lurks this rising threat of Russia. Only by understanding the rich cultural nuances of this region is the United States and our international partners around the globe able to better engage to thwart the instability that lies on the horizon. And with that, Dr. I. Thank you, guys, for, for a very interesting presentation. Um, before the, the most fascinating part of the session will begin, I just want to mention, if you go to the pipeline uh, slide, please, for a second. Uh, not gas pipelines, but oil pipelines. It's still different. <laughs> so I just want to mention, uh, I think we didn't specifically mention that baku Cheham pipeline. This uh, became operational, uh, I, in fact, I was in the beginning of negotiations as a former diplomat, and it became a big deal uh, to change the dynamics of the 
regional and global geopolitics. So it was, it is still is the only pipeline which bypassing the Russian territory. And it contributed greatly to, to strengthen uh, independence of the literal countries. When I say literal countries, not of Iran, of course, but of the former Soviet satellites. Uh, baku Cheyham pipeline begins, uh, originates in the capital of Azerbaijan, Baku. It goes through Tbilisi, Georgian capital, and th then goes down to Turkish Mediterranean uh, port of Cheyhan, and they are uh, taken by tankers to the world markets. So the daily capacity of that oil is one million barrels of oil. But let me tell you something. Azerbaijan doesn't have that much oil. So without a Kazakh oil, it would not be viable. So that's the capacity of that pipeline. So uh, I would, uh, representatives for that region would agree with me that the baku Cheyham pipeline was a really, really the core uh, of the so-called uh, Caspian oil diplomacy. That was the core of the strategy of Gaydar Aliyev at the time. But many people don't know the fact that uh, Abul Faz El Chibay, who was the first president of independent Azerbaijan, he studied that politics. And Gaydar Aliyev effectively continued that. So this is just a quick introduction to that issue because it's really, really key. At this time, I would like to open the floor for questions and answers. And we have outstations, uh, multiple outstations linked through VTC uh, to have a chance to participate in this very important session. For those who are in the room, please use your microphones in front of you or one of those microphones around the room. Uh, ask your question, make a comment, because we done this, we chosen this topic because of many of your requests. Any questions, any comments at this time, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It should be already on. some mistaken idea about the language of Chechnya and just 10,000 uh, Chechnyans living in Georgia. Uh, and these Chechnyans, of course, they speak Chechnyan language. And when we were talking about the language of regions, we did not mention the Georgian language. The Georgian language is a uh, unique language and just Georgians speak this language and no any similarity with Chechnyan language. It's just corrections. This correction acknowledged. That's absolutely correct. Thank you. No more questions and no more comments for now. Okay. Any other? Qu yes, sir. Please. Yeah, Gus and Dr. I and Bob Bauman. A lot of you folks know me. I'm Scott Blaney. I'm the current ops guy at Call. Yes, Scott. Senator Thank Army you. Lesson. I've talked to all of you up there. And uh, one of the things I like to stress to the audience is that. The history of the Caucasus, the whole Caspian Basin, and even if you go up to into Italy and Spain and the former areas that were once conquered by the Islamic hordes, will point out that uh, this is a dynamic region that's changing daily. Russia's got their fingers in it. And I'll tell you right now where there's a concentration of Chechen being spoken, it's a Beji oil refinery because they're the primary force behind the ISIS, or the Daesh, I prefer to call them Daesh, efforts on behalf of uh, al-Baghdadi in Iraq. They're some of the fiercest fighters. And they export that back home. So any places that you see that are relatively calm today, don't count on that in the future. Because the calculus is immensely complicated. Matter of fact, just today, open source has that the Russian Air Force is going to establish a permanent base outside of Damascus, Syria, and man MiG-31s, 29s, and hind helicopters and Havoc helicopters to fight on the behalf of the Assad regime, who's tied to the Iranians, who we are collaborating with on some airstrikes. 
So for a, if you think about the region being static, it's far from it. As a matter of fact, the refugees, doctor I mentioned, they are a conduit for the Daesh people to infiltrate Italy, Spain, from Liberia, from Libya, as well as migrating across the border into Turkey, fomenting hate and discontent among the Turks, among the Kurds, among the Yazidis. So this little region right here, which is, I think, about the size of the state of, if you just take that region right there, about the size of Georgia and South Carolina, you'll see that it doesn't take too long before Russia starts to influence what's going on in eastern Ukraine, the Baltics, and the common theme was driven by oil and gas. Not so much anymore because what has happened in North Dakota and Canada? We've nearly become energy independent, so they're no longer dependent upon us. So what I'd like to suggest is that if you people are interested in that type of an operation and knowing what's current, there's two places to go. Opensource.gov, which you can all do on Nipper, and once you learn how to search that, you will have cutting edge information you won't find on Google News, you won't find it on Fox News, you won't find it on Drudge Report. And by the same token, Call does a daily product, this is an advertisement for us, by the way, does a daily product on current operations on all of these things I'm talking about. Afghanistan, Operation Freedom Sentinel, Resolute Support Mission Afghanistan, OIR, OAR, which is Operation Atlantic Resolve in the, Balk in the Baltics as well, I, I misspoke, the Baltics. And the efforts right now that where we are pivoting, the U.S. Army is pivoting to a deployed force from CONUS. No longer will we have massive forces stationed in, in Europe. But the Eastern Europeans want our forces there on a permanent basis. So you folks leaving here will go to a brigade or a division somewhere, and you'll find out as you walk in to 3rd ID or 10th Mountain Division, you are going, going to go over there as part of a 150-man staff of the division an operation, an operate a, mul a mobile command element that'll be in seven or eight different countries and will soiree down into these areas we're talking about for mill-to-mill -mill engagements. This is the type of stuff that if you get your head in the game now, you won't be surprised when you show up at Fort Stewart and you find that if you're an aviation battalion and you're heading into Illisheim, being forward deployed into Por uh, Poland. But the politics, what Dr. Bauman talks about, what Gus talks about, what Dr. I talk about, are all important in the overall equation of understanding the people you'll be shaking hands with and actually working with on a mill-to-mill -mill or a diplomatic basis. So those are just some of the things. Uh, again, my name is Scott Blaney. I'm on the Goable, B-L-A-N-E-Y. And if you ping me on Sipper or Nipper, I can hook you up with this type of stuff. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Scott. I, 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 I can publicize you more say, by saying <laughs> that you've been great interacting with us even before the session. Thank you for that. Uh, I just want to add that, you know, the stage of this basics, left hand, right hand kind of stuff is gone. If we really want to move forward, not to be left behind, lag behind, compared to some major powers such as China and Russia, which is trying, working very hard to do certain st stuff globally, geopolitically, we really need to have a real knowledge. We, we are planning to raise our sessions on the higher and higher levels and conduct those regularly. So uh, thank you for this comment, very, very professional. Yes, sir. I have a comment. Here, as I, as I see, is a uh, geopolitical competition uh, on oil and gas. Could uh, you introduce Russia, yourself, please? Between Russia and the uh, West, and then, as you see, that uh, uh, there is a there is a pipeline. It go, going to from the Baku to Novorossiysk, and then that was a, at the time that was a, the only pipeline that goes out of the Russia, uh, Azerbaijan uh, in the pre-Soviet Union. I mean, the, during the Soviet Union, with the uh, with the uh, creation of this Baku Baku Tbilisi Jehan, at the same time the kind of oil and gas connections in Ukraine and Moldova. The uh, the uh, the current uh, the current geopolitical struggle in here is basically the fact that uh, if Russia can uh, control this um, eastern Ukraine and Moldova, basically uh, basically the uh, the uh, geopolitical game is gone done. Uh, there is n there is nothing else Russia uh, Russia will do in that respect. So in the uh, in the uh, Caucasus case, 
Yes, that's right. Uh, there are uh, problems problems over there. But uh, but the major problem that uh, we uh, but uh, th there is over there is the Iran. If Iranian board uh, Iranian uh, situation uh, clarify, and then uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia can may have way much better and easier way to uh, deal with the West and the rest of the world than right now. So. Uh, Iran uh, can play a very big role in here, uh, not very much Turkey, because basically Turkey isolates itself uh, b uh, because of the uh, closing, closing the borders with Armenia. So there is, uh, uh, d uh, that's, a, that's a problem with it. But, uh, but uh, Iran is, has a uh, very good connection with Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, all of them together. So in that respect, it creates a, it creates a more, uh, the Iran can have a more uh, bigger geopolitical uh, geopolitical uh, influence in the region than uh, even even Russia or Turkey. So we have to see that how uh, the relations with, uh, work with, between Iran and the West, and then what type of the concession that can that they can make, and then the, the opening of Iran can maybe solve the lots of problem and then made bring uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and uh, Georgia much closer to the West. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Great. Anybody else? Yes, sir. On uh, Nick's comments about Iran being a, a major player of the 500-pound gorilla in the area, I understand that, that if Iran takes a bigger interest and can possibly stabilize the region and bring, as you mentioned, uh, a high tide raises all boats, what does that do to U.S. interests in the region I mean, Iran and U.S. have some friction. I guess I could say that legitimately. Uh, so if, if Iran has a larger influence on Azerbaijan and Armenia and Georgia, how does that affect our security interests, our national security interests in the area? Is that question to any of us or audience? Anybody, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but just to that question, before we answer that question, is there new rapprochement between the West and or Iran can change this dynamic? Say it again, sir. Can you use the microphone, please? Yeah. Okay, anybody, anybody want to answer that question? Uh, Dr. Bauman or Gus or John? or anybody from the audience? Well, I, I'd be happy to take a bit of a stab at it. I think that looking at the region without including Turkey and Iran is foolish, right? And having an appreciation for the fact that both of them have powerful influence helps us develop an appreciation for the fact that the Caucasus serve as a pivot point or maybe a fulcrum for diplomacy in the entire area. And it can stand as an opportunity or as a threat. And the way we paint that in, in our own country and in our partner uh, nations is, is up to the people that vote for those particular politicians. And so, you know, should the United States move forward with Iran? Should the United States encourage this, that, or the other thing? Part of the reason that we've had this panel and that we've had so many questions is a lot of the dialogue that you're going to see on television doesn't include anything you've heard here today. And it needs to. And it starts with the culture. It starts with the religion. It starts with the economic drivers. And they're huge. Those economic drivers are going to undergird all of the diplomatic activity that we do country to country on the bilateral front, as well as multinationally. And for the students who are just starting into CGSC in their C2, C200 block, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you start learning about the dime, that diplomatic information, military and economic, that's where the leaders are drawing their resources from. And if they're not able to think about that kind of thing, then it's, it's really hard to drive through a black and white sound bite when in a lot of cases those black and white sound bites are both wrong. Uh, I've just started an additional thought about uh, Iran and, and the possibility of its expanding influence. There are some natural breaking influences in the region that would tend to contain that uh, uh, to a degree. Uh, to the extent that any player in the region increases its strength and influence, others are going to meet it to balance it off a little bit. You have Russia and Turkey with great interests. 
Um, you have the possibility of a special relationship between Iran and Azerbaijan, uh, but at the same time, uh, there are issues. Uh, Azerbaijan is far more secular um, and not, uh, in fact, not at all appreciated by the, uh, by the clerics uh, in Iran. Uh, so there, would, there are some cultural tensions that uh, would tend to balance out uh, some of that influence. Now, to the extent that, of course, Iran gets uh, economic strength, uh, there are lots of ways that, that they can bring that to bear. Um, but again, uh, the dynamics of this region uh, uh, suggest that it's, uh, it's highly competitive in, in terms of, uh, of that influence. Yeah. If, I, if I can add to that uh, question, um, Scott, just give me a second. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting question because just to take the example of the former Soviet Azerbaijan and Iran, Iran, more than 70 million, and uh, I think everybody realizes it's becoming increasingly very sophisticated and powerful regional uh, country, regardless of the sanctions. It has one, probably, of the strongest armies in the region, at least. So now, relationships between Iran and Azerbaijan, the former Soviet Azerbaijan, has nine million only. Nine million population compared to the ethnic Azerbaijanis living in the northern provinces of Iran, which is estimated between 20 and 30 million. So more Azerbaijanis in Iran than in the former Soviet Azerbaijan. Now, because of the long-term assimilation of those Azerbaijanis as a part of the Iranian statehood, many of them don't consider themselves kind of the same way Azerbaijanis like the former Soviet Azerbaijanis. The point is the huge differences cultural, ethnic, mental, etc. So the former Soviet Azerbaijan is even more usually educated, speaks several languages, etc., compared to the Iranian uh, Azerbaijanis. This is just some nuances. Um, another thing is, just a quick uh, answer to, to that question, a comment to that question is, that because of the past experience, um, Iranian Persian major majority of government been assimilating giving good jobs to the ethnic Azerbaijanis. For example, the highest religious cleric, Ayatollah Khamenei, is ethnic Azerbaijani. If you have good job, if you are fed, you are not thinking about revolutions. So just a short uh, answer to that question about the dynamic. Every time, the people who know the nuances of that region, every time when it comes to settlement of some conflicts, be it between Iran or Azerbaijan, and the, my, my teammates were absolutely right that the relationships are very tense. As stronger Azerbaijan is getting, former Soviet Azerbaijan, as more jealous Iran is becoming, and sensitive to that is becoming, because one day they're concerned that those Azerbaijanis would uh, demand the cessation, like what's happening in Ukraine right now, and would demand to join the former Soviet Azerbaijan. That would be disastrous to Iran. You know why? Just looking at the ethnic uh, location of ethnic Azerbaijan, I mean uh, Persians, majority Persians, they are like this across the country compared to ethnic Azerbaijanis who are concentrated in the northern provinces of Iran around the city of Tabriz. It's very easy to carve that territory if there is certain powerful movement or party, and, but of course there's gonna, gonna be a lot of bloodshed if ever that would happen. <laughs> so, but this is just, uh, when it comes to other uh, issues uh, in the region, in the greater Caucasus or uh, trans-Caucasus, because there have been a lot of uh, things going on over the centuries, it immediately touches upon uh, the interests either of the regional powers or global powers. It's becoming very complicated. So the, question, the point is, nothing easy in the Caucasus, never. Like in the Middle East. Any other questions? Scott, you had a question? Oh, yes. Yeah, thanks, Doc. One of the things I'd like to stress again, Russia and Iran are very cozy. If you want to go take a look at the latest strategic and operational air defense assets, just visit and take a look at what the Russians have sold to the Iranians to defend their nuclear sites. That being said, the world is watching the Kurdish efforts against Daesh in Syria and northern Iraq, and oh, by the way, if you look at the Kurdish population, it soirees into Iran and, north, and southern Turkey. So they got a, a green swath. And so this 
bid for independence and a, and a unified homogeneous peoples has not gone away. As a matter of fact, it could be argued that it's magnified itself in numerous manifestations around the world. But in here specifically, when you're talking about what was the mechanism for the Russians to take the Crimea? What were the mechanisms for the Russians to grab eastern Ukraine? It's not dissimilar to some of the same mechanisms used by Adolf Hitler to get Lebensraum and to repatriate his ethnic Germans spread out of, spread over Europe in the early 30s. So the point is that you all of a sudden showed up one day in the Crimea and the Russian, ethnic Russians had Russian passports. So what's it make sense? I'm not a Georgian citizen, I'm a Russian citizen. See my Russian passport? Same thing has happened in eastern Ukraine. It'll happen again, but as you take a look now at the combination of Russia, Iran, Iran, Russia supporting Syria, it's kind of like these are speed bumps on the way down to that particular theater of operation right now. Doesn't mean it's going to stay that way, and the dynamics will change. And Gus will tell you, being a DA, uh, DIA, right, Gus, that you go and ask some of those folks and sit down to somebody and say, well, I want to talk to the Kurdish expert. Well, do you want to talk to the Iranian Kurdish expert? Do you want to talk to the Syrian Kurdish expert? Do you want to talk to the, Kurdish, the, the Turkish Kurdish expert? No, I want to talk to who knows everything there is to know about the, Ukra about the, the, uh, the uh, Kurds. And you will find that there may not be one person. You may have to go ahead and, and cogitate and put all this together yourself and make your own decisions to advise your commanders and discuss with your polads your particular courses of action that you may be days away from executing in Iraq or Afghanistan, or for lack of a better place, in Vincenza, Italy, or Lavov, uh, uh, Ukraine. So keep in mind, you've got to stay attuned to the current situation and keep history in the, not in the rearview mirror, but it's in the periphery because what happened between the Turks and the Armenians around the turn of the last century, 1900s, matters today. Because, you know, people don't remember Pickett's charge too much except for Civil War buffs. But believe me, Turks and Armenians, and I've got a Turkish officer sitting right here, could probably tell you the, Cir the Turkish side of the story of the 1910-1903 uh, events. And then you talk to a, a uh, Armenian, totally different stories, but it's fresh in their minds because they're raised with it. A lot of people in these regions are raised with that from little boys and little girls all the way up to when they become grandfathers, and they pass those messages down. So that all enters into the calculus. Sir? Hmm? Please. Thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation this afternoon. My question is, given a worst-case scenario where Russia and or Iran assume hegemony over the Caucasus region, what strategic risk is that to U.S. interests in that area, given the productive success of North American energy? and our ability to potentially fill that void within our Western allies and other countries. Thank you, sir. Anybody? That's a big one. Uh, <laughs> I would just offer a couple of big, broad brush strokes uh, on, uh, on the question. If, if we hypothesize that uh, either Russia or uh, Iran actually gained hegemony uh, over the region, the, the U.S. is fairly well situated um, by virtue of, uh, as uh, Scott Blaney noted, uh, exploding uh, oil and gas production and whatnot to uh, weather some of that, but it would have a big impact on a lot of our allies um, and, uh, and regionally. The, the mitigating factor, though, is that I think either Russia or Iran, yeah, were they to get to swallow up the entire Caucasus, would have a serious indigestion problem. Uh, because these, this is not an area that is all that conducive to one player stepping in and, and owning and, and running uh, the whole thing. Uh, uh, the, the Soviet experience, in some respects, was, was kind of an exception. Uh, and I don't know that that could easily be replicated in uh, our current environment. So I would just offer that. Anybody else? Gus, John, or anybody from so the audience? The other consideration uh, I would offer from uh, that perspective is that it, it, while there is a lot of petrol related aspects, that it's also going to try some of our alliances, right? And the first and foremost is NATO. Is NATO, what we've seen so far with the Ukraine and what we saw in 2008, 2009 with Georgia, is NATO prepared to take action? What does that action look like? What should that action look like? You know, not 
what does it look like, but what should it look like? Does that involve, you know, putting uh, American troops on the ground? Does that involve putting American weapons on the ground? Are they, do we call them self-defense weapons? And if it is a self-defense weapon and it flies and it lands in somebody else's territory, is all of the sudden it, it gets painted by a pretty uh, good, uh, at least Russian and Iranian propaganda machine as something that's offensive? So those are the types of things that we have to consider as we look at, at what those challenges are. You're going to get to go through this uh, later in the year anyways for some of your exercises. So um, I think that's a great question. What I would look at instead of worst is probably most likely. And I think what we're going to see is a continuing simmer of the caucuses for the time to come. And, and I think it's where do our allies uh, feel the pressure. If there's a cold winter, petrol becomes a really big deal. Uh, the, the reason we've had such, such success from the international community perspective with the sanctions against Russia is because we've had a mild winter. Uh, if that flips this year and we have a really severe winter, all bets are off. Is there a consensus across the European community? You'd have to ask the European community. I'm not sure that we see a consensus for any kind of military action uh, on, on a caucus front or on a Baltic front. So great question. I wish I had better answers for you. Anybody in outstations want to add, uh, add to this comment or answer the question? Outstations for banning Winsec, Fort Leonard Wood, and others. Dr. Meyer, are you there? Okay. So anybody in the audience want to add something? Yes, sir. Comment about the uh, Russian interests in this region. It's obvious that Russia does not want to like, take control of this region and take another problem. The Russia interest is just to not let the like, uh, Nabucco pipeline, uh, I mean the gas, natural gas line to build. And also, uh, if, you, if you follow the like, like, uh, last month's uh, news, the Russians still, Russian still like, uh, advance their borders. And now, be behind this like uh, autonomical South Ossetia, there is uh, some part of the Bako Jehan uh, pipeline. So, this is obvious. The Russians just want to like uh, control the situation and anytime initiate the or conflict or something. So, the the people who is gonna build this like uh, to put money for some future development of this region, everybody is just afraid and. Okay, it spent like a billions of money and for what? Like Russia can any time start the again the conflict. So the problem is, uh, in my opinion, that and the solving, I don't know, maybe somebody has idea how to solve it. Thank you. Uh, if Russia wanted to take control of Georgia, they could do it. They could do it uh, before, like a uh, Georgia starts, like a uh, democratic way life, and uh, before we face it, like a uh, joining European and NATO, European Union and NATO. But Russia did not want it that, and always was like a uh, difficulty. The people, like a uh, people of Georgia, does not hate Russians. Okay, I, I, I will make correction. Before 2008, before 2008, we did not hate Russians. But right now, because of the Russian policy, right now because the, like we get the uh, 100,000 more uh, like refugees from the South Ossetia, the ethnic Georgians, so we are not gonna like uh, never be part of Russia and we never want to be like an ally of Russians. But if Russia wanted to be like a Georgia, control Georgia and have uh, like uh, the friendly relationship with Georgia, they could do it before 2003, 2002, but they, they never tried this, even no diplomacy and yeah, that's a problem. I think they, they just want to have like a, some, uh, some key points on this region and some problems and any time to initiate, that's all they, their goal. There is their goal, okay? 
Anytime mm -hmm. they can like uh, destroy this uh, Baku Jehan pipeline, and they will say, oh, we don't know who destroyed it. And yeah, we don't know, because there are maybe some terrorists from Chechnya came and they destroyed it. In fact, it happened recently, right? Yeah. There was a huge explosion, and that's Thank regularly you. happening. Yes, sir. So basically what it is, uh, in Russia's geopolitical game in Caucasus, is going through the um, manage of the chaos. Russians, uh, Russians trying to create the chaos. They do not want to physically uh, occupy the uh, occupy the area, but with creating chaos, basically they are uh, managing the area. They don't need to put the soldiers on the ground, but just uh, with the um, um, uh, chaos management, they cre uh, they do whatever they want. Thank you. Um, given this, uh, the so-called Russian strategic military culture. From time to time, we can see, I would absolutely agree with you, with your comment, the uh, heavy-handed approach, like we witnessed in Georgia uh, when uh, Mikhail Saakashvili attacked Srinvali, right? And then, uh, I don't know if he realized or not, then the, uh, uh, the Russian unit units at the border were ready to invade with the help of Abkhazia's Ossetians. Uh, and those Ossetians on the Georgian side already had the Russian passports. Or that was 2008, Five Days War, uh, or the situation in Chechnya, uh, et cetera, uh, and Ukraine, of course. Uh, but generally, I would expect the increasingly approach would be a sel selective, trying to avoid that approach. Uh, as you absolutely correctly said, Russia doesn't really need to invade, in my opinion, because it has so much leverage across the former Soviet Union. Big uh, ethnic Russian community in Estonia and other Baltic republics, in, in Caucasus, Abkhazia, Ossetia, uh, and other places, Transnistria in Moldova, Eastern Ukraine and Southeastern Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's so many to leverage for Russia without invading. It doesn't really have to go physically put a big force on the ground. Yes, sir. Yes, hello. Um, Major Nolan from Canada. Uh, question first for the panel, and then hopefully uh, my friend from Turkey will pop up. Uh, why is it in Turkey's national or best interest to perpetuate the regional insecurity of the uh, Caucasus region vis-a-vis -vis the nagorno karabakh dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan? Specifically, uh, looking at Russia having a strong footprint in Armenia and now uh, coming into Syria uh, as well. Thank you. Who want to answer that question? <laughs> Mehmet Bey, is it your sense? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Can I answer? Yes, sir. Uh, like I just issued the, between Georgia and Armenia, right now it's some, uh, as the uh, doctor mentioned, it's like a, a like a old churches and or like a historical belongings, and we have some discussions which is the, like origin, it's the Armenian or Georgian. And like a, there is talk about the church which is which was built in the eighth century or ninth century, and that's all. As an outsider looking in, right? So if, if I were to look at Turkey, I don't think that it. To, to answer your question directly, I don't think that it's not in Turkey's national interest. I think Turkey's got its hands full, right? I think that the the Kurdish population that it deals with internally and the Kurdish pressures that it deals with externally, I think the refugee flow that they've been pressured with as a result of what's going on in, in northern Iraq and Syria have all be, been big influencers. Turkey played a pivotal role in peace in the Levant, the development of peace in the Levant up until uh, Syria started to devolve. 
And, and I don't think it's that Turkey doesn't want to do it. I think that Turkey's preoccupied. Uh, and, and that's how I see it as an outsider. So. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Major Evan Kelly. My question is more about the, uh, the conflict in Armenia and Azerbaijan and what is the economic importance of the Nagorno-Karabakh region to either side? Thank you. I think this is far more cultural, political, and identity-based, uh, historically based, than it is economically based. Um, the, uh, especially in the current, uh, current climate, uh, I don't think either side stands to gain greatly economically uh, over, uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh. This is uh, about assertion of deep historical claims, um, and it's uh, again, territorial and cultural, in my estimation. If I agree. In, anybody else? I agree. Um, I can add to that answer. Actually, I've been to Shusha, which is the ancient capital of Nagorno-Karabakh Khanate, in fact, my father and mother from there. And uh, this is a beautiful place. And the historical background of importance of that area is every major power tried to conquer it. And it has, in order to get to Shusha, which is the actual, the, the current capital is Armenians called Stepanakert. Azerbaijanis call it Khan Kendi. Khan Kendi means the king uh, village. In from Turkic or Azeri language. Um, so and the, uh, during the Soviet time, Stepanakert became the capital. Uh, and if you go to Shusha, you cannot just drive straight. You have to go like this. And this is actually on the hill. So beautiful. This is a beautiful, it used to be called always uh, small Switzerland because of the nature and uh, the climate and everything. And the most talented people came in Azerbaijan came from that particular little region. So why it's so important, I would agree with my teammates. Economically, not so, but historically, strategically, always been important because of the strategic location. Per Persian Empire tried to conquer it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but part of the problem is, uh, under the Catherine the Great, um, when the, the Russian Empire started to expand eastward, um, with the help of the main architect, whose name was Griboyedov, the Russian architect, he was a senior diplomat uh, and a writer, famous writer, so Griboyedov. Uh, they started to relocate ethnic Armenians and others from different places to different places. And Nagorno-Karabakh was part of this scenario. So the reason was to create the artificial barriers, ethnically and religiously, in order to be able to fulfill the principle approach of divide and conquer. That's why this Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict historical roots coming from. This artificial igniting this, this hatred by, Rush, by the Russian Empire at the time. Uh, so that's kind of the roots of it. So, this is absolutely correct. I do not see any specific economic benefits of that area. But yet, historically, for Azerbaijanis in Karabakh, or oh, Karabakh actually is wider, bigger. Nagorno-Karabakh, which is in Russian stands for mountainous uh, black garden. That's what is translated. This is very sensitive. So after the, I'm trying to avoid the certain terms, I would say it's occupied right now. Occupied with the help of Russians in addition to 20% of the territory. And all the people from Shusha came to the rest of Azerbaijan, including to the capital. They are very adamant to return to that area. Historically, it's been always important for them. For Armenians, that area is called Artsakh. This is, they, they are ready to die for this area. So, both sides are very adamant to fight for this area. This is historical question, not economic or cultural question. Does that make sense? I think we're about the time to complete the session. Again, responding to many of your requests, 
we were planning to do Caucasus and Baltics, but given the time frame, we decided to separate, to divide. So next time is going to be likely Baltics, the same format by the Baltics. And we will continue doing that regularly. And there is an intent also to connect to RAF units and others who are requesting these kind of sessions on the high level. So we'll be inviting other uh, subject matter experts and we'll be raising the level of these discussions. So uh, this is some reading sources for your convenience. And uh, the next slide, please. You can see the link to Al Rakmo Language Culture Management Office website that the video and other related information would be posted on that website, in, including the further announcements. So thank you again. Anything you wanna, before we complete? Anybody before we finish the session? Thank you again for joining us today uh, and for the next time. Thank you.